गुड इवनिंग ऑल एम आई ऑडिबल कैन एनी बडी कन्फर्म यस सर सर ऑडिबल सर थैंक यू सर एंड मैडम ओके आई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू द डे फाइव ऑफ आवर ए आई सी टी ट्रेनिंग एंड लर्निंग फैकल्टी डेवलपमेंट प्रोग्राम ऑन क्लाउड एंड फॉर कंप्यूटिंग प्लेटफॉर्म्स फॉर आई ओ टी एप्लीकेशन टूडे एक्चुअली द फर्स्ट सेशन वॉज गिवेन टू डॉक्टर विनायक कर सर बट ही इज नॉट वेल so i have to handle that session so in the first session we will discuss about uh, energy efficient uh, cloud computing in the second session we will see the integration of three technology that is iot fog and cloud so we will see what kind of integration issues are there and uh, how to solve that issues and what are the real challenges when you want to integrate uh, various environment but in first talk we'll discuss about uh, energy efficient cloud computing so if you see in a traditional system earlier uh, we are using uh, non renewable energy like if you see uh, the way the vehicles are running it is uh, yeah, vehicles are using fuels we generally call that as a fossil fuel and uh, we are using uh, either petrol or diesel in various vehicles to move from one location to another location we call that as a, uh, the non uh, renewable energy and this non renewable energy is not uh, going to sustain for a longer period of time moreover uh, this non renewable energy is very harmful uh, to human uh, body it is also harmful to our environment so as a solution nowadays uh, people are looking for the renewable energy based solution where we can utilize the solar power we can also utilize the wind wind power hydro power which will be sustained for a longer period of time and uh, this renewable energy is not harmful to human uh, body as well as to the environment that's why the renewable energy is much more popular so if you see the traditional computing system prior to the cloud computing uh you will see uh, every industries or every organization is maintaining their own infrastructure so if you maintain your own infrastructure so uh, you have to uh, pay the electricity charge you have to pay the cooling charge you have to pay the maintenance charge so most of the time the devices that we are using in our day to day work they are not uh, useful one of the example you can see all educational institutions are having so many labs but you can see in the night time uh, most of the labs are closed so we are not using these computational resources okay so we want uh, to save that thing by moving uh, the traditional infrastructure to the cloud infrastructure so whenever we are going to move from cloud in uh, traditional infrastructure to the cloud infrastructure definitely we are going to save the energy in the similar fashion uh, if you want to move from the non renewable energy to the renewable energy definitely it will also be helpful so based upon this uh, idea uh, this lecture uh, i am going to present which covers both uh, non renewable energy algorithm and renewable energy based algorithm so these are my uh, contents i'll uh, discuss some of the challenges related to the energy then i'll tell you about some of the definitions then straight away i'll tell you about some of the non renewable energy based algorithm which is used by the traditional data centers but nowadays if you go for microsoft or you go for ibm you go for amazon or other cloud service provider they are using the renewable energy so slowly we are moving from the non renewable energy to renewable energy you know the day by day the price of the uh, fuels is also increasing right so in place of that we want to use the renewable energy to uh, to get a sustainable environment as well as to reduce the cost so that is the overall outline of this particular talk so earlier uh, people uh, mainly targets that how you can utilize a particular resource like if you see a sequential programming in sequential programming case we are not using using multiple cores or multiple processor so our utilization is not good so we want to we are moving from the sequential programming to the parallel programming 
So in parallel programming case, we are properly utilizing each and every processor or each and every core in the processor. And we want uh, all the resources need to be G. Okay. Let's say uh, you can say it is a close to 100% busy, right? So that we can properly utilize these resources. And also, uh, nowadays uh, people are looking into that uh, not only utilizing the resource is important, but also how to reduce the power consumption is important. Like if you see our smartphone, every day we are charging our smartphone, right? So everybody wants that if I want to charge, if I am charging my phone or my smart one, it should go for a longer period of time. If not one day, it may be two days. If not, if not two days, you can say it is three days. So we don't want to repeatedly uh, follow the same routine to charge these uh, gadgets, whatever we are doing in our real life. That's why not only utilization is important for a particular resource or a server or a computer system, but also the power consumption of the system is also important. One of the practical example, you can also say that in our computer system, we have sleep, we have hibernate, right? So instead of uh, uh, putting the computer system on, we can uh, make a sleep option, we can use sleep option, or we can use hibernate option, which will save the energy, right? Now, there are many, uh, uh, many uh, research article focuses on how we can map the energy consumption with CPU utilization. For example, you, if I take a graph by taking y axis and x axis, this is my x axis and this is my y axis. So, in let's say in x axis, I am taking CPU utilization. CPU utilization. And we know CPU utilization is either 0% or it can increase up to 100%. So the utilization lies in between 0 to 100%. In the y axis, I want to take power consumption or you can say energy consumption. Okay. So power consumption we generally we calculate in the form of watts. Right. So we'll see here that if we are increasing the CPU utilization by increasing the workload to a particular system, whether power consumption is increased or not. Right. Suppose you are utilizing your computer system for 10%, 10% of the time. So whatever power is consumed, if I increase the utilization to 20%, so how it really impacts on the power consumption? So if you go for the traditional studies or earlier studies, this is the relationship between the CPU utilization and power consumption is a linear one. That means if the CPU utilization is increased, then the same rate, the power consumption is also increased. But we have to see whether it is true for all the systems that we are using. Let us consider a server, or you can say in a higher end machine, like you can say, uh, suppose I'll consider a supercomputer or a data center. So if I want to increase the utilization, how it actually really impacts the power consumption that we have to observe. So obviously higher CPU utilization usually implies greater energy consumption. So we are very much interested to know whether this relationship is a linear one or it is a non-linear one. Okay. If linear one, then you can say, yes, it is increasing. Your CPU utilization is increasing. That means power uh, consumption is also increasing in the same rate, but it is not true for all, all the cases, right? Sometimes we can see when the, uh, CPU utilization is close to 100%, then drastically the power is uh, increased, okay, or power consumption is increased drastically, right? So such type of observations we want to make in order to decide that how to make an energy efficient system. Now, let us see uh, some of the facts related to uh, this energy. So in order to utilize the cloud resources, especially you can talk about the data center or workstation, or you can talk about the devices that are used in the data center. The CSPs are deploying several customer application without any major function of the energy consumption. Initially, everyone is trying to increase the CPU utilization. They are not concerning about energy consumption, right? But uh, as we have seen that, uh, Energy consumption is also important because if you are not taking care of the energy, then it is going to impact us only in a long term. That's why we need to concern both factors. 
resource utilization as well as our energy consumption. So if you are focusing only on the utilization of a particular resource, so definitely you can achieve high performance, but it is impacting our environment. And you can see here, one of the study also says that whatever power is required to run a particular data center, like Google has data center where our emails are kept. Facebook is also having data center where uh, our posts are kept, right? WhatsApp is also having data center to keep the files, temporary files for some period of time. So the energy consumed by a single data center is same as 25,000 householder. Like if you consider a particular village, in that village suppose 25,000 people are staying. So whatever energy they are consuming or whatever power is required to them, it is same as a single data center. So it is an old study by Professor Buya. But if you see the current study, they says that the number of householder is increased to 550,000 or more. Okay, so a single data center is equivalent to 50,000 householder or more. So you can see, imagine that how much power is energy, uh, power is consumed by a single data center. So if you see in all over the world, there are millions of data centers are there. So imagine in order to run the millions of data center, how much energy is required. Similarly, uh, if you see the carbon dioxide, right? Like we are using vehicle, carbon dioxide is generated. Similarly, in the data center, if you see the source of the data center, if that is electricity, how electricity is, uh, is generated. If you go to the particular source, you will find the carbon dioxide is generated to uh, generate the electricity. Carbon dioxide is, it is uh, uh, generated highly, okay, or it is generated uh, very heavily if you go to the source of the any electric connections. So the amount of carbon dioxide emits from a data center in 2008 will be quadrupled by 2020 and it is going to be more by 2030, right? That's why we need to concern about energy. And some of the other studies also, if you see, there is a study uh, 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 in one of the research report of United States. It says that ICT equipment, ICT equipment means our mobile is ICT equipment, our laptop is ICT equipment, our desktop is ICT equipment. So whatever energy consumed by these equipment, okay, it is roughly 8% of the total energy consumption. And if you see our COVID situation, during COVID time, earlier we are not using our uh, desktop or laptop system, right? We are not using our mobile phone to attend the meeting. But due to this COVID pandemic, nowadays uh, every person is having more than two gadgets, two or more gadgets to maintain this thing. You can attend one meeting, uh, it, you can attend the same meeting using your mobile phone as well as your laptop. Suppose there is a practical hands-on session is going on. You want to do that one. So you can log in into two system. In one system, you are seeing the lecture, another system, you are writing the code. Right? So the ICT equipment is responsible for 8%, but uh, it will be increased to 50% in a decade. And it is more also. Nowadays, every device, whatever we are using, they are consuming energy. And number of devices are also increased. And one of the studies says that per person, nowadays, we have seven devices. We are using two, three devices maybe. But if you see in average, each person in the world is using seven gadgets, seven ICT equipment. So imagine how much energy we require, how much power we are consuming. And if you go for uh, the research and development farm, that is Gartner, it is a leading uh, R&D farm, who says that uh, ICT equipment is responsible for 2% of global carbon dioxide emission in 2007. But it is now, it is very high. It is a old study. 2007, it is very old, right? But if you see current uh, carbon dioxide emission, it is increased to a greater extent. So our objective is to not only focus on the utilization, but also focus on the energy consumption. Like you are considering two different objectives. Both objectives you want to fulfill, right? So you have to balance this objective. You should not say that my computer system is utilizing 100%. But what about power consumption or energy consumption? It is increased to a greater extent. So you have to balance this factor. That's why if you go for cloud computing, it can increase the utilization of resource and reduces the number of IT hardware equipment. 
one of the example i'll tell you let us consider two different server so let's say this is my one server let it be server one there is another uh, server which is identical to server one which we call a server two assume that server one is having the workload of 35 percent 35 percent server two is having the workload of 30 percent and both are identical identical means their configuration is same their capacity is same their computational capability is the same okay so as they are identical you can migrate the load of server 2 to the server 1 migrate means i want to move the load whatever current load of server 2 that i want to migrate to the server 1 so that it is busy for 65 percent of the time and I'll put the server to in the switch up mode if I want to run only one server. On the other hand, you can see I'll run two server. One server is busy for 35% of the time. Another server is busy or handling 30% of the load. So if you want to reduce the number of IT hardware requirements, then obviously the first solution is the preferable one. Or you can say the relationship between the CPU utilization and power consumption. If it is a linear one, then the first solution is better. But if the relationship is not linear, then obviously second solution is better. Because if you increase the utilization, then power consumption is drastically increased. In that case, obviously the second solution is better. So you have to study based upon some experimentation in order to know whether taking a single load in a particular server is better okay by switch up another server or you have to run two servers simultaneously in order to achieve the work so cloud computing can potentially reduce the cloud uh, global carbon dioxide emission because earlier they are having traditional infrastructure and traditional infrastructure is not better because we are not monitoring each and every device but if you move to the cloud, so whenever you are not using your resources, your resource can be minimized. Okay, our resource can be put in the sleep mode or hibernate mode. Or if you are not using for longer period of time, I can put in the turn off mode. In that way, what you can do, you can reduce the carbon dioxide emission. So the energy consumption of a processor is approximately proportional to processor frequency and square of the processing voltage that we already know right how we are calculating the energy in order to calculate energy you require power as well as utilization okay so a computer is utilizing let's say 50 percent of time its utilization is 50 percent for a, over a particular period of time and power consumed by that particular device if you multiply these two then you will get the energy now let us see some of the definitions to understand how energy uh, related problems are point in the field of cloud computing. See here, here I have taken n number of servers. So you can see this is my server set that is S is my server set and I am taking n number of servers. They are S1, S2, S3 up to Sn. Okay. And each and every server, okay, like uh, you have n number of servers, you can say n number of servers are present in a particular data center. Right? So each server is having R min and R max. So it is represented in the form of two tuple. What R min indicates? R min indicates minimum resource of the server SI. And R max is the maximum resources of the server SI. So in order to represent this minimum and maximum resource, here we have considered the frequency. Like you can see here in server S1 case, the maximum working frequency is let's say 700 megahertz and our processor also having some frequency right and minimum working frequency is let's say 100 megahertz so you can represent s1 in the form of a two tuple by saying 100 comma 7 700 100 is the minimum resources 700 is the maximum resources okay this is about the server we can execute a particular work in the server. Let that work is nothing but job J1. Okay. And in order to execute job J1, 
job J1 has some requirement. Let's say the requirement of job J1 is 200 megahertz. So you have a range of 100 to 700, okay? But job one requirement is 200 megahertz working frequency. So your server one is capable to do that one. So we have assigned job one to the server one. Okay, we have successfully assigned job one to S1 because whatever the requirement of job one that is fulfilled by server S1. Now, what is the remaining capacity? The remaining capacity is the maximum capacity minus whatever capacity you have given. That is 700 minus 200. So you have 500. So if you want to execute another job in the same server simultaneously, then the condition is that that job's frequency should be less than or equal to 500 megahertz. Right? Because 200 megahertz you have already given for job one based on its requirement. So in order to execute another one, you require the capacity should be less than or equal to 500 megahertz. Otherwise, server S1 is not able to execute the job J2. Okay. Now, coming to job second definition. In second defini definition, we considered another set. In the first one, we have seen a set S. Here we consider a set V. V is nothing but a set of virtual machine. So we consider here M number of virtual machines V1, V2, V3 up to Vm. Okay. Like a server is having minimum and maximum frequency, a Vm is also having minimum and maximum frequency. Because BM is created by taking the resources of a server, physical server. This is a virtual environment. But virtual environment, whatever resource you are creating, that resource is a part of your physical machine. So for example, there is a job J1. I consider one job J1. Its maximum frequency is 600 megahertz. Minimum frequency is 100 megahertz. One side you have job. Another side you have server or virtual machine. And let us consider you have three virtual machines. One is VM V1, another is VM V2, another is VM V3. So whether it is a virtual machine or it is a server or it is a job, we are representing in the form of minimum frequency and maximum frequency. Right? For example, if I go for virtual machine V1, its minimum frequency is 100 megahertz, maximum frequency is 500 megahertz. V2 is another virtual machine that is 100 megahertz. 600 megahertz is the minimum and maximum frequency. Similarly, in the case of V3, it is 200 megahertz, 800 megahertz. Right? Note that the virtual machine V1, V2, V3 is taking the resource of what? The server S1. Okay? Earlier, you are assigning the job J1 to whom? It is you are assigning job J1 to S1. But now, you are assigning job J1 to either V1 or V2 or V3 based upon the requirement. For example, in this case, it is given as 100 and 600. Okay, if you see, it is given as 100 and 600. And you can see here, here there are three virtual machines with capacity 100 and 500, another virtual machine with 100 and 600, another virtual machine with range 200 and 800. Now I have to check that whether this particular J of J1, it has requirement of minimum and maximum frequency, whether that frequency is satisfied by V1 or V2 or V3 or any combination of V1, V2 or V2, V3 or V1, V3. So if you see here, job J1 case it is 100 and 600. Let us check with V1. You are satisfying the minimum one, but you are not satisfying the maximum one. That means virtual machine V1 cannot alone execute the job J1. However, if virtual machine V1 and V2 is working together, then they can execute the job J1. Then you may ask me a question that if virtual machine V2 having 100 and 600 is the minimum and maximum frequency, and job J1 is also having minimum and maximum frequency of 100 and 600. So why not you are giving V2 alone? Why you are taking with V1? So obviously you can take with V2. 
you can take with v1 and v2 or alone v2 can also execute that particular job similar context you can see that uh, what are the virtual machines that are suitable for a particular job okay now coming to the third definition here we are talking about the weight and priority like operating system also you know that uh, some of the jobs are high priority jobs some of the jobs are low priority jobs like if a, you are executing a healthcare application in healthcare application the job is more sensitive in comparison to let's say an entertainment application so you have to distinguish one application with another application or you have to create a different category based upon that you can say this is better this one is uh, you can you can defer its execution for some period of time that you can decide so if you calculate wi wi is nothing but the product of pi and ri what is pi pi is nothing but the power cost ri is nothing but the resource so in order to run a particular resource like we are running our computer system we are using our computer system a power is consumed for that computer so if you multiply these two you will get a weight value that is wi why you are calculating wi because once you calculate wi of each and every resource you can apply an allocation algorithm which is going to decide which server is assigned for to with a, a, which job which job is suitable for which kind of server right so here we are calculating this wi factor sometimes to uh, find the priority among different jobs right that is also possible so this factor is calculated based upon the power cost and resources now another definition is called as the service level agreement so you know whenever a consumer want to take a service from a provider they have to sign the service level agreement the same as our srs document which we have studied in software engineering right in cloud context we say that is a service level agreement so assume that n is the total number of sla level what is service level agreement service level agreement is nothing but it can be divided into number of levels like you can say level 1 like here you can see level 0 if you subscribe to level 0 then number of virtual machine is 1 to 200 like internet case also you have seen suppose you want to subscribe internet from a particular provider let it be bsnl so they say that if the bandwidth is 30 mb then you have to pay 500 rupees if the bandwidth is 60 mb then you have to pay 1000 rupees if the bandwidth is 100 MB, then you have to pay this much. So based upon your requirement, you are going to decide. So whenever you want to run a particular application, first you have to decide that which level is suitable for you. Like if you are subscribing to SLA level 0, so SLA level 0 is giving you 1 to 200 virtual machine. Suppose you want to run an application for your institute. Let it be a web application. So for running that web application, suppose you require 50 virtual machine. So level zero is sufficient. But if you go for multinational companies, they are running a lot of jobs simultaneously. In that case, they can go for higher level of service level agreement. For example, if you go for level one, you will get a 200, one to 400 virtual machine. If you go for level two, you will get 401 to, uh, 401 to 600 virtual machine level 3 will give you 701 to 800 and similarly level 4 will give you 801 to 1000 okay so before signing the service level agreement you have to decide that how many virtual machine can fulfill your requirement so if you choose lower sla level the number of resources are very low if you choose a higher one then the number of resources is more at the same time you have to decide that which requirement is more suitable for you and the execution performance is sacrificed but the energy consumption is reduced okay sometimes you have to make a trade-off in trade-off case whatever performance you have achieved it traditionally that can be sacrificed but at the same time you are giving importance to energy consumption our objective is not to sacrifice the performance not the objective is to sacrifice the energy consumption our objective is to balance these two 
okay now let us see a simple problem i'll tell a very simple problem this problem is called as a job submission problem you are given with a set of jobs and you are also given with a set of servers you have to decide that which job is suitable for which server right so a job is given with minimum and maximum frequency that we have seen similarly a server is also given with minimum frequency and maximum frequency so by looking into this minimum frequency and maximum frequency we can decide that whether a particular job can be executed in a particular server or not right if all available servers cannot satisfy you may ask a question sir whatever servers we have they are not at all satisfying the requirement of a particular job then what you will do so you have to make a virtual environment or a simulated environment where you can take multiple server and you can combine their capacity to fulfill a particular requirement right that's why the vm manager has to power on a proper server or it has to make a simulated environment which will help the uh, help that particular job to execute in the corresponding server so there are two inequalities we have to choose right first inequality says that the server's minimum frequency should be greater than or equal to the minimum frequency of the job right second inequality says this job indicates that the minimum frequency of a particular job this is the minimum uh, frequency of a particular server so we will check the first inequality if server's minimum frequency is greater than or equal to job's minimum frequency that is sufficient that can that particular server can execute that particular job not only this is one equality you have to also satisfy the second equality what second equality says it says that uh, the maximum job frequency is should be lies in between the maximum frequency of a particular server and the maximum server frequency plus some overhead alpha definitely there should be some overhead one example i can tell you suppose i am giving you a uh, 32 gb pen drive but when you insert that 32 gb pen drive in your system it is not showing complete 32 gb right it is showing some 31 or 30 point something okay in the similar fashion there should be some kind of overhead we are considering that overhead by taking alpha now let us take an example let us see the job j1 in job j1 what is the minimum frequency the minimum frequency is 100 maximum frequency is 512 and let us assume that you have a list of servers okay these servers are let's say available in amazon web service okay and there are 10 available servers in this list let us take an example of 10 servers so what i have to check i have to check the both inequality which i told you in previous one you have to check the minimum frequency of both the server and job and maximum frequency of the server and job and you have to see that both inequality is satisfying or not for example if i take server number 1 server number 1 what is the minimum frequency the minimum frequency is 50 what is the jobs minimum frequency it is 100 so 50 greater than equal to 100 is it true the answer is no so server 1 is not suitable for job j1 coming to server 2 server 2 case what is the minimum frequency again the minimum frequency is 50 what is the minimum frequency of the server sorry minimum frequency of the server is 50 what is the minimum frequency of the job it is 100 so again 50 is not greater than equal to 100 so server 2 is also not suitable for job 1 it may be suitable for other jobs but it is not suitable for job j1 okay now if you see if i go for server number 3 okay in server number 3 the minimum frequency of the server is equal to the minimum frequency of the what minimum frequency of the job so it is satisfying our requirement and the maximum frequency of the server is 300 which is less than equal to the maximum frequency that is 500 okay the job so both inequality is satisfied that's why server 3 is suitable for job j1 
in the similar context if you see server 4 server 6 server 7 and server 9 they are suitable for j job j1 then you can apply a allocation algorithm to decide out of this particular list which one you are going to choose which one is more appropriate for you somebody will say that if server 3 is executing some work then you assign it okay subjected to both requirement is satisfied right because why to unnecessary on a new machine why not uh, adjust the load with the existing machine okay somebody case that no we'll assign a new machine because the power consumption is considered as a linear one so in that manner, you can decide that whether server three is suitable for your four, six, seven, and nine is suitable for you. Now, sometimes what happens, these servers are kept in different cluster. Like here you can see, here I have considered different cluster. So this is my virtual cluster A, this is my virtual cluster B, this is my virtual cluster C. Like that you assume that there are X number of virtual clusters are there. Under a particular virtual cluster, you may have more than one server. And in each and every server, you can create one or more number of virtual machines. So whenever there is a scarcity of resources in a particular virtual cluster, what you will do? You have to migrate the load from one virtual cluster to another virtual cluster. For example, whatever resource available in the virtual cluster A, they are exhausted. Okay. You have submitted so many jobs to the virtual cluster A. Virtual cluster A is now exhausted. It is not going to accept any more requests until unless whatever the existing jobs they are going to complete. If they are completing, then you can get space. But otherwise, if you are not able to get the space, what you will do in that case? You have to migrate your load from one cluster to another cluster. And not necessary, these clusters are present in one boundary not under one organization, not under one institution. They may be present in different institutions. So while you are migrating your load from one virtual cluster to another virtual cluster, you have to look into the bandwidth. For example, in this case, you can see if you want to move your load from region A or virtual cluster A to virtual cluster B, then the bandwidth is 250 megabits per second. But if you send to virtual cluster C, it is 500 megabits per second. So these things are very much important. You are migrating means what? Your load you are giving to someone. So you have to see that uh, the faster movement uh, also need to be done between two different clusters. So in that way, we can decide that uh, which virtual cluster is suitable to accept the load. You cannot send uh, arbitrarily. You have to first see that whether that particular cluster is also free or not. If that is also exhausted, then it is not possible to ac accept any more load. So that type of things you need to consider. Now, here we consider a several clusters, right? In this model, what we have seen? We have seen different uh, uh, cluster. Each cluster is having limited number of virtual machines. They are running on top of a physical machine. and you need to calculate the percentage of CPU utilization. Why? Because complete utilization, you cannot give a de dedicated one, one job to completely use your resources because one job may not use the whole resources. That's why we are interested to calculate the percentage of CPU utilization. And it is used to judge whether a VM has enough resources available for a service or not. For example, you have created a particular virtual machine in which you want to run a particular job and it is only taking 30% of the resources or its utilization is at max 30% and computer utilization you know it is 100%. So you are left with another 70%. Okay, you are left with another 70%. So you can assign another job to the same virtual machine subjected to the utilization of that particular job should not exceed 70%. That's why it says that first you have to check that what is the current utilization and how much load you are giving to that particular virtual machine. By considering this factor only, you can decide that whether a particular virtual machine can accommodate a new job or not. Right? 
Now, I have uh, told you network bandwidth is very much important when you want to move your data from one virtual cluster to another virtual cluster. So it ranges, right? Like our bandwidth also ranges from megabits to gigabits, or maybe in future we have more than that also, right? So this also we need to consider because not only the computation is an overhead, but also the communication also is an overhead. So both we need to look into whenever we want to migrate a virtual uh, a task from a virtual cluster to another virtual cluster. Okay. So generally the tasks are submitted through a queue in the cloud, right? We are putting a global queue. From that queue, your service is going to be provided, right? We can we can decide that uh, which uh, 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 task is uh, busy or which task is free, right? Which task is executed or which task is the present in the queue and whether the resource is free or not. Then we can assign a particular task to a resource. Now, we have to look into both utilization. Utilization of a task as well as we need also the utilization of uh, the virtual machines. Both we need to consider. Then only we can compare like in the previous case, we have taken frequency, minimum frequency and maximum frequency of the task, minimum frequency and maximum frequency of the VMs or the server. So if you want to design a new model here, right? So you have to observe the different parameters of the task as well as the resources. Like here you can see in this particular model, each cluster has a job queue that contains information of all the tasks. What are the properties of a particular task? The properties of the task may be the task ID, it may be the arrival time, it may be the CPU processing time, it may be the data size, or it may be the CPU utilization. Not necessarily you are going to follow all the parameters, but more or less all the models that are used in energy efficient cloud computing, they are follows these parameters. So see this experiment, this is a simple experiment which I told you earlier, x-axis we have taken CPU utilization in between 0 to 100 percent, y-axis we have taken power consumption from 70 watts to 150 watts, right? We have taken in the range of 70 to 150 watts. Now these are the IP address, you can see these are IPv4 address, right? Which we represent in the dotted decimal format. So we are running different workloads in different IPs, okay? And how much CPU they are utilizing or what is the power consumption of these IP addresses that we are observing in this experiment. So if you see a linear curve, linear means what? If one is increasing in the same rate, other is also increasing. But if you look into this figure, you will see it is linear initially, but it is not linear at the end. Like you can see up to 10, 20 percent, let's say whatever utilization, whatever utilization you have in the same manner, the power is increased. But if you go for beyond 70 percent or 80 percent, you can see the power consumption is drastically increased. That's why the relationship between the CPU utilization in energy consumption is not a linear one, right? Earlier people assume that they are linear one, but uh, now it is, you can consider it is not a linear one. If you insert, if you are giving more load, then definitely it is going to increase drastically. So based upon that, uh, what we have seen here, if the utilization in is between 0% to 20%, if the utilization is between 0 to 20%, generally we consider 0 to 20% is called as your ideal state. You are doing a very small work, or you are not doing at all. That is called as ideal state. So 20 to 50 percent, what you have observed, it is slightly increasing. 50 to 70 percent, it is more increasing. And when it is 70 to 80, 70, 80 up to 90 or 100 percent, in that case, it increases greatly. Right? That's why many researchers suggested that the utilization of the resources should not exceed 70 percent. Because if they are increasing more than 70 percent, the power consumption is increases greatly. So in this context, they divide this energy consumption into of this virtual machine into six different levels. 
so what are the levels in level 1 they consider ideal state or very small amount of work you are running in a physical machine or a virtual machine level 2 is in between 20 to 50% level 3 they consider 50 to 70% beyond 70% we have seen there is a high increase of an power consumption okay or a high amount of energy is consumed that's why they consider each 10% is a different level that is 70 to 80% it is level 4 80 to 90% is level 5 and 90 to 100% it is level 6 now what how you are going to calculate the energy if the machine is ideal then assume that alpha watts you are consuming per second consider our mobile phone our mobile phone is switch on but we are not using our mobile phone then also you will see after 30 days or 60 days your battery is going to each day the battery is going to okay and after 30 to uh, 30 days or 100 60 days or 90 days something like that your mobile is going to be in switch off mode but if the utilization is in between 0% to 20% then you will consume alpha watts per second that is in the ideal state but additionally you will consume beta watt in the similar fashion if the utilization is in between 20 to 50% then you will consume alpha watts per second which is there in the ideal state but three beta amount is added because utilization you are increasing and the relationship is not linear one so that nonlinearity we consider here by multiplying a particular factor like here you can see 50% to 70% it is 5 beta 70% to 80% it is 8 beta 80% to 90% it is 11 beta 90% to 100 beta it is 12 beta so the more utilization you have now you have to multiply with a big factor okay so if you are increasing it if you go for 90% it is 12 12 means drastically you are increasing the energy that's why they put a threshold that you should not go beyond the 70% if it is not absolutely necessary now let us see the simple problem now you will understand whatever i have discussed theoretically so let us consider there are five different tasks these tasks are having their arrival time processing time and utilization so if you observe the task 0 task 0 the arrival time is 0 processing time is 20 and utilization is 40% so i have started a resource r0 or a virtual machine r0 in which i have assigned task t0 and task t0 takes 20 time that is 0 to 20 and it is utilizing only 40% so you can see here only 40% of the resources it is utilizing but the resources utilization can go up to 100% right now coming to t1 what t1 is asking t1 is asking 3 to 8 3 to 8 means 3 plus 8 that is 11 it will start at 3 and at 11 and utilization is 50% yes we can assign it because 40 plus 50 is not exceeding 100% so it will start at 3 so this is your 3 and it will complete by 11 8 unit of time now let's say t2 is coming t2 is asking the time in between 7 to 23 7 to 23 means 7 plus 23 so 7 to 30 the utilization is 20% okay so if i am going to assign in the resource r0 then what will happen 40% plus 50% plus 20% is going to be your exceeding your 100% this 110% right so it is not possible to assign t2 to resource r0 that's why what we did we started a new virtual machine r1 in which we have assigned the task of t2 right now another interesting thing you can see here now t3 is coming what is the time for t3 t3 is asking you time 14 to 10 okay 10 unit means 14 to 24 so at 14 unit you can see in r0 t1 will be completed so by 14 it will be complete right and at the same time at the unit 14 r1 is also free r0 is also free r1 is also free right to accommodate task number t3 which require 
forty percent of the resources. Now it is really challenging for you to decide whether to go for R zero or to go for R one. So you need a policy to decide that whether R zero is a better or R one is better. So there is an algorithm that is called as energy conscious task consolidation, which we call as ECTC. What ECTC says? ECTC says that you have to see the minimum utilization. Okay. For example, if you are going to utilize this this resources here, okay, you are going to assign T three here for forty percent. So the utilization of R zero, okay, if you see, I am not calculating exact one. You can see at these times the utilization is forty percent plus forty percent, so it is eighty percent. But if I assign T three here, which is seen in R one, okay, so here you can see. the utilization is 40% plus 20% this 60% so together it is roughly 80% but here it is 60% so if it is not a linear one then obviously 80% is more energy is consumed but 60% case you will consume less that's why r1 is assigned with t3 as per the ectc algorithm ectc also consider other factors some of the factor is that what is the minimum power consumption what is the maximum power consumption so the minimum power consumption is considered as 20 and maximum power consumption is considered as 30 these are the standard values by assuming that 200 watts is the minimum one 300 watt is the maximum one also you can see here that p mean and p max p mean this here also i have used p mean okay that indicates minimum one right and later also we will use p max right and the difference between p mean and p max is called as p delta okay and uj is nothing but the utilization tau 0 tau 1 tau 3 represents whether the task is running alone or a task is running in parallel okay or it or what is the processing time of that particular task that's three things you need to find like you can see suppose this is my virtual machine r0 okay and suppose one task is running alone so that is nothing but your tau 1 how much time this task is running alone suppose again another scenario you can see there is let's say i am taking resource r0 a task is running here another task is running in parallel with that task so that is nothing but your tau 2 and tau 0 is nothing but the total processing time of t0 on that basis you have to calculate whether r0 is suitable for a particular job or r1 is suitable for a particular job if r1 is the only option then you have to assign it if r0 is the only option then you can assign it whenever you have two choices you can break that uh, choice by calculating this fij like here we are calculating r0 it is 120 r1 it is 200 and if t3 is assigned to r0 64% is consumed right another case if you see other case it is consuming more than that okay it is consuming if you see the utilization perspective 64% like here i told you 80% right but if you calculate it is going to come 64% because this point onwards the utilization is not 80% the utilization is only 40% if you calculate that uh, you will find uh, the less utilization in r1 that's why that particular task is assigned to r1 okay but when you go for other algorithm they suggest that uh, in order to minimize the number of resources in order to minimize the number of resources for example you have developed a algorithm it is taking three machine you have developed another algorithm it is taking only two machine so third machine you can put in switch up mode in that context t3 need to be assigned to r0 because if you go for t3 need to be assigned to r1 then you can see this period of time the utilization is 20% this period of time the utilization is 20% plus 40% so it is 60% and this particular period of time it is again 20% so in average it is 34.4% right 
similarly you have to calculate what is the utilization if t3 is assigned to r0 so based upon that uh, you have to decide which one is minimum the minimum is you have to choose in the ctc algorithm and there is another algorithm that is called as max util in max util case you have to calculate the maximum maximum utilization those machine have been giving you maximum utilization that machine you have to choose and after assigning t3 if you are going to assign t4 t4 is not going to be accommodated in r0 and r1 because it is going to take 70 percent of the time 70 and 40 percent is 110 percent so this is machine is not suitable 70 percent and this uh, 20 and 40 that is 60 right 60 plus 70 is 130 percent so r1 is not suitable so we have to go to r2 we have to execute the task t4 in resource r2 yes this is the max util uh, algorithm where the cost function says that uh, first you have to find the average utilization during the processing time of the current task because that current task is also running with the other task which earlier uh, which is arrived early so based upon that you have to calculate what is the utilization factor okay so the main advantages of this max util is that uh, energy consumption is reduced and second is that uh, the number of active resources is reduced that is the reason why the max util algorithm is preferred over the the ectc algorithm like here you can see this calculation like t3 case if you calculate t3 case in resource r0 it is coming 64 and if you calculate in r1 case you are getting 60. so after calculating this one you can decide which one is giving you more utilization okay based upon that you are going to assign obviously t3 is getting more utilization in r0 so we have assigned it so now the task number t4 can easily be accommodate in resource r1 so if you follow ectc algorithm you need three resources r0 r1 and r2 but when you go for this max util algorithm you require only two resources that is r0 r1 that is the advantages of max util algorithm over the ectc algorithm there is another algorithm that is called as ETC, that is called as Energy Aware Task Consolidation Algorithm. What it says? It says that uh, in each and every machine, you have to put a particular threshold. The threshold is called as CUT, but that is called as CPU utilization threshold. The threshold here, it is considered as 70%. It varies from one system to another system. So first one, it says that uh, First, you have to dispatch a particular task to the virtual machine if and only if it is not violating the CPU utilization threshold. Okay. And if there are more than one virtual machine is there who is not violating this uh, CPU utilization threshold, then you have to decide which one is the appropriate virtual machine for your task by following the best fit strategy. If none of the virtual machine is available in the same virtual cluster, so you can send that one to other virtual cluster subjected to that other that particular the destination uh, virtual cluster is not overloaded, right? Now, third one says that if both virtual cluster B, suppose there are three virtual cluster, virtual cluster A, virtual cluster B, virtual cluster C. Let's say three virtual clusters are not free. So in that case, what you will do? You have to violate the CPU threshold, CPU utilization threshold and see that whether you can accommodate that in the same virtual cluster or not. Okay, that is the, that is the concept behind ETC. So let us see a small example. So these are the set of tasks that is given to you with their arrival time, processing time, CPU utilization and data size. Now, you are assigning one task, uh, T0 task to the first virtual machine. So T0 is assigned to B0. Now T1 is assigned to also to B, B0, right? At that time, B1 and B2 is not active. Now, the cumulative utilization of B0 is 60%. Okay. Now, this bar represents, it is 70%. Okay. You can see it is written as 70%. Now, when T2 is coming, T2 is asking, what is the utilization? 
what is your current utilization 60 percent 30 and 30 is 60 percent if you assign t2 then 60 percent plus 40 percent is 100 percent that means t2 can be accommodated b0 but why you have not assigned the reason is that uh, if you assign t2 to the b0 then the cpu utilization threshold is exceeded right the threshold i have taken is 70 percent so it is going to exceed that is the reason why you are not assigning t2 to here rather than you are preferring to start a new virtual machine and start the load in that particular virtual machine okay but see this particular scenario now cluster a virtual cluster a is having three virtual machine it cannot create more virtual machine and you have reached the cpu utilization threshold in each and every virtual machine now a new job is coming let's say that job is t6 t6 cannot be accommodated in b0 cannot be accommodated in b1 cannot be accommodated in b2 what is the reason the main reason is that if t6 is accommodated in b0 b1 b2 either the 100 percent is 100 percent utilization is exceeded otherwise uh, in other case you can say the cpu utilization threshold is exceeding 70 percent so in that case what you can do you can migrate the load to other cluster so you can see cluster b is now free i can assign to cluster b cluster c is also there it is also free i can assign to cluster c but the bandwidth for cluster b is 250 megabits per second the bandwidth for cluster c is 500 mb per second so obviously you are going to choose cluster c instead of cluster b now see a typical scenario Cluster A wants to share some load with cluster B and cluster C, but cluster B and cluster C is fully occupied. Then what you will do? So whatever load you want to give to cluster B, cluster B is not ready to accept it. Similarly, cluster C is also not ready to accept it. In that case, you will see there is no other condition, right? No other way to solve this problem. So in that case, you have to see that by violating the CPU utilization threshold, can we accommodate that thing or not? Like here you can see the if I violate the uh, CPU utilization threshold, like I am assigning T6 to the B0, so the combined utilization is 30% plus 50%, that is 80%, and 80% is greater than or equal to your 70%. You can violate the cot, okay, but you can fulfill the requirement of the customer. So in the worst case, if required, you are going to violate the CPU utilization threshold. Other case, you are not going to violate the CPU utilization threshold. So these are related to our non-renewable energy. Now coming to our second point of discussion, that is called as renewable energy based algorithm. What renewable energy based says? Renewable energy based algorithms are developed because these petrol and diesel, or you can see uh, the fossil fuel which is coming under the fossil fuel gas and other things these things will not sustain in the environment for a longer period of time okay and some of the motivations also you can see here like we have 8.6 million data center as per a study and out of 8.6 million data center 3 million of data centers are present in united states and in each and every data center in average you have 50,000 to 80,000 servers. So you have different scale of data center, small data center, medium data center, large data center. But in average, you can see 50,000 to 80,000 servers are present in the data center, in each and every data center, which consumes 25 to 30 megawatts of power. And if you go for the NRDC report of United States, it mentioned that 140 billion kilowatt of hours of electricity is required by end of 2020. Now we are require more also by 2030 it is quite more and global data center if you consider all over the data center that is 8.6 million data center they are they need 416 terawatts of electricity per year. So imagine how much electricity is required how electricity is generated electricity is generated by petrol diesel or gas or coal right which is harmful and which is also limited. That's why we want to move from non-renewable energy to renewable energy. 
So what kind of renewable energy you can use? You can use a different renewable energy. Like you can go for biomass or you can go for hydropower. You can go for solar. You can go, go for wind. Because they are not harmful. But when you go for non-renewable energy, like fossil fuel, so they are harmful to environment. They are generating different kind of gases. They are generating carbon dioxide. They are generating different uh, particle, which is harmful to not only to our environment, but also harmful to the human, human being. Okay, that's why we want to go to the renewable energy. So you can see, suppose you want to planning for sunlight. So what you need, you need photovoltaics. They are going to convert the sunlight into electricity. Next, if you want to go for wind energy, you uh, wind energy converters are there. They are going to convert it into wind energy. Similarly, water is there. From water also, you can generate electricity. You can see there are various dams are there in our country. So there, the electricity is generated, electricity is stored, and electricity is also transferred. You can also burn the biomass to create uh, electricity. So if you are using such uh, method, then what happens? Not only you are in uh, uh, reducing the energy cost, but also you are also reducing the unnecessary un, uh, unhealthy gases or carbon dioxide or other gases or dust particles, whatever generated that you are also reducing. But the main problem is that uh, we know that uh, every day is not sunny, right? Someday may be cloudy. Every season you will not get good water, okay, or sufficient water to generate electricity. That's why both renewable energy and non-renewable energy is important for us. But first we will try to minimize the resources by giving renewable energy. And when there is a scarcity of renewable energy, we are going to use non-renewable energy because renewable energy sources are not available 24 into 7. Now this is the figure you can see. The data centers are powered by, these are the renewable energy. They are also powered by non-renewable energy, which is provided through this grid or smart grid. Today we say smart grid, right? But we have also attached with uh, this renewable energy. First, we will try to manage the power or uh, power by using renewable energy. When there is a scarcity, you can use the resources from the smart grid. In this way, the scarcity of uh, these uh, resources or scarcity of the power can be avoided or we can increase up to, a lot, up to a larger extent. Now, based upon that also, many researchers have proposed various algorithms. Like here, they model each and every request in the form of start node, node, and duration. Start time, node, and duration. Like here, you can see I have taken uh, nine different uh, user requests. They are start time, they are node, and their duration. And you can see there are two colors here. The bottom one represents it is a renewable energy and the up one right represents the non-renewable energy. So first I'll try, I told you, first we'll try with the renewable energy. If renewable energy can manage that one, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll go for the non-renewable energy. So see here, like U1, U1 can be assigned to data center 1 or data center 2, right? And U1 requires one node for four unit of time. So if E1 is given, it should be given for four unit of time. This is time unit zero, time unit two, three, and four, and it requires only one node. So whether you assign to the data center one or data center two, you are given with the renewable energy source. That's why we are given to data center one. Okay. Now coming to U2, U2 requires only one node for one unit of time. So you can assign here or you can assign here. Both are same. So you have assigned to data center one. Now when U3 is coming into picture, U3 can be assigned here in the data center two or it can be assigned here. U3, U3, U, uh, U3 and U3. So if you are assigning to the data center D1, then you can see here two slots are non-renewable. Two slots are renewable. But when you assign to data center 2, all the slots are renewable. So obviously, data center D2 is a better solution in comparison to data center D1. 
So in order to dispatch these user requests to the data center, we have different policies. First policy is called as future ever best fit policy. We, we, what future, be, future ever best fit policy says? It says that uh, you have to find the cost in each and every data center. If the cost is best in the uh, data center D1, you give to data center D1. If it is best in D2, you give to D2. See here, there are two type of energy we considered here, as I said earlier. Brown energy is called as your non-renewable energy. White energy, okay, or green energy is called as your renewable energy, right? So let us dispatch this uh, task to the two different data centers. So see here, now the task D, okay, is mapped to task D or we consider user request four is given to the data center D1 as well as to the data center D2. But the, when you calculate the cost, the cost is coming 0 0.5 in the data center D1 and 0 0.9 in data center D2. So obviously the lowest cost is achieved in 0 0.5. Why it is 0 0.5? You can see these black slots. You have for, for these black slots, you have to pay. For the white slots, you need not pay. So it is 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2. But in here, in this case, it is D, it is D. So it is nothing but 0 0.3 and 2 times 0 0.3 because you are taking two slots. So it is 0 0.9. So you achieved best in data center D1. That's why you are assigning to data center D1. So you can see. You can map to both the data center, but finally you have to assign to data center D1. In the similar fashion, E for the, the, the user request E, we have calculated the cost in the data center D1. Also calculate the cost in the data center D2. So we got one here, we got 0 0.3 here. So which one is better? Data center D2 is better. So finally we have mapped with the, the data center D2. We have cancelled in data center D1. Similarly, you try with F, we are getting 0 0.6, 0 0.3. So F is mapped to data center D2. Similarly, if you map like this, this is the final assignment for assigning all the tasks, all the or all the user request or service request to the different data center. So there is another policy that is called as round robin. In operating system, also you have seen this policy, which says that in circular fashion, you have to assign the jobs to the different machines. Okay, first job to the first data center, second job to the second data center, third job to the again first data center, fourth job to the second data center. So if you do in the circular fashion, like D is assigned to the data center D1, E is assigned to the data center D2, F is assigned to data center D1, G is assigned here, H is assigned here, I is assigned here. So it is not a good assignment because you are not looking into renewal energy as well as non-renewal energy. Simply you are assigning by following a particular order. That is also not good. There is another algorithm that is called as HAREF, highest available renewal fast. So while you are assigning user request to different, uh, user request to the different uh, resources, so you have to check that uh, which resource case you are getting more renewal energy that resource you have to assign the particular request. See here, for example, if you are going to assign that user request D to data center one, so the number of renewable slots is assigned, it is eight. But if you assign the same to the data center D2, DC2, then number of renewable energy slots are given as seven. Which one is better? DC one is better. So the task D is assigned to data center DC1. Okay. Now coming to the next one E. So if you are assigning E to the data center D1, all the slots that are given to you is non-renewal slots. They are not renewal slots. That's why it is zero. But if you assign the task E to the data center 2, it is going to give you two non-renewable to renewal slots and rest slots are non renewable. So, obviously, highest you are getting in data center D, uh, DC2. So, the task is assigned to data center 2. In this manner, you can assign the request to different data center. So, as a conclusion, what I can say, we have uh, 
this is the final assignment. So you can uh, you can see in this lecture we have discussed uh, three algorithms in the non renewable aspects that is ECTC, another is MaxiFill, another is ATC. And in renewal case, we have discussed about FABF, HAREF, and round robin algorithm. So nowadays, uh, all cases, all, all in all the research areas, people are looking into the energy, and they are also primarily focused on how we can utilize the non-renewable energy, okay, and how we can avoid the use of uh, non-renewable energy. How we can utilize renewable energy and avoid the non-renewable energy. So these are the some of the references you can go through. Thank you everyone. If you have any question, you can ask. Any participant having any question? Okay, thank you everyone. We'll start uh, the next session at uh, 8.20 uh, after five minutes.
okay welcome back so we'll start the second session in the second session uh, as i said earlier we are going to see how to integrate uh, iot fog and uh, cloud infrastructure till now you have seen uh, the different uh, infrastructures individually first we have started with the cloud then we have seen uh, fog yesterday lecture you have seen iot but uh, how actually we are going to integrate one or more infrastructure so based upon that uh, this lecture i am going to del deliver so we'll start with the uh, introduction why the integration of uh, these three technologies are required why iot and cloud infrastructure cannot uh, directly integrate why there is a need of uh, an intermediate infrastructure that is fog then i'll tell you about the methodology of uh, collecting various research articles in the field of this iot and fog and cloud infrastructure so they have followed uh, some particular methodology to find the papers in this particular area especially when we conduct research so in that uh, uh, while you are getting a research you have to see you have to follow a particular methodology to select some paper so how these papers are selected from the literature then we'll see the integration of the literature which is called as c2f2t c stands for cloud f stands for fog t stands for things in internet of things we take the term t that is called as things so there are three things three layers one is cloud in the top layer fog is in the intermediate layer t is in the bottom layer so the mapping between these uh, three infrastructure we'll see based on the literature so whatever literature we are going to discuss regarding the integration they are based upon modeling techniques or you can say they are based upon analytical modeling they are not following the business modeling okay business modeling is not followed but they are following only the analytical modeling then we'll see the future research directions in the integration of iot fog and cloud and in the offline during offline lecture i'll discuss about uh, one of the simulator which is available by the joint effort of professor buya and professor swamyaganti gosar from iit kharagpur so they have developed uh, a simulator that is called as ifoxim where you can conduct uh, experiment related to the fog computing you can design the topology you can use existing topology so that uh, kind of things you can do by the help of ifoxim simulator so you know nowadays uh, our society uh, needs are fulfilled by various technologies and some of the recent technologies include social media cloud computing big data or you can say uh, fog computing osmotic computing internet of things data analytics mobile technologies vehicular ad hoc network these are various areas that are transferring our society to uh, to provide each and a service or to get the things very easily in comparison to the traditional way of uh, achieving a particular thing so really we need uh, integration of uh, various technology in order to provide better services to the customers better services to the society so people uh, nowadays focusing on internet of everything rather than internet of things iot is a very popular term a very successful term by the help of iot you can achieve a lot of things we can generate different kind of data we can take uh, some preventive actions in case of any type of uh, hazardous environment but uh, in future you need to integrate iot with other technologies in order to provide you provide internet of everything which is also referred as third it platform in which we want to integrate various processes various people and various technologies like you can integrate iot with fog environment you can integrate fog with cloud environment and in this lecture we are going to integrate uh, we are looking into find the solution for integrating cloud fog and iot all in all the three and one infrastructures so integrating various technologies is the main goal behind the ioe but uh, in iot we are looking how we can 
connect multiple physical objects into a network and provide interconnection in the network. So this is the only primary difference between the IoT and IOE. And if you see, there are huge number of application you can find in IoT. Especially you can find in the smart city application, healthcare applications, and other related applications. And if you see these applications, these application can be categorized into these category. First one is called as large scale distributed control system. Like the number of devices in IoT, IoT devices are increasing day by day. There are many studies says that uh, these many devices are going to connect by 2025. These many devices are going to complete, uh, uh, going to connect by 2030, right? So we have a very large system. And this system is not a centralized system. No, there is no central node to, uh, to manage these systems, okay? There are numerous uh, devices are there. They are not also under a single administrative domain. That's why we call this is a distributed system. And managing this large system is really a challenging task. Similarly, we have geo distributed applications. Now, the applications are not uh, hosted in a single data center. They are data centers are geographically distributed. And the user can also select which data center he or she wants to deploy a particular application. There are some applications are there which need to be executed in real time basis. Minor delay also can hamper the execution of that particular application or can lead to a catastrophic effect. So you can go for some time dependent application or you can say they are real time applications where you have hard deadline. There are some applications are there where you have soft deadline. You can violate that one, but uh, you have to fulfill the hard deadline. And there are many applications are also there. They are very sensitive to the latency. Like a healthcare application uh, you can consider in which you need the immediate attention of the doctor. Your device is able to identify there is a abnormality in the reading of a particular, uh, let's say, uh, particular parameter. So that uh, things the, the sensor need to actually inform to the doctor, right? So here, if you see the latency need to be as minimum as possible. Otherwise, we may lose a human life. So there are many applications are there. They are very sensitive to the delay. But in such application, if you are connecting IoT with the cloud, you are not going to get, you are not going to get low latency because cloud is actually very far away from the IoT devices. And the existing cloud infrastructure, if you see, they are not uh, well equipped to manage these are kind of applications, whether it is a large scale application or you can talk about geo distributed application or you want to make some standardization that need to be followed by all service provider so that uh, a user can move from one provider to another provider without any intrusion. It is very difficult. So interoperability is really a challenge. And these things uh, is not uh, fulfilled by the existing cloud infrastructure. So in order to solve the requirement of the IoT devices, we need uh, some new approach which can solve our problem of scalability, solve our problems related to the interoperability, flexibility, reliability, efficiency, availability, security. We need an intermediate layer between the IoT and the cloud. That is the main uh, reason behind introducing the POP computing in between the cloud and IoT devices. So that the services can be near the IoT devices. So whenever you have a time critical application where the latency is uh, an important factor, in that case, you can achieve that thing using the POP devices. Not only that, if you connect a cloud to the IoT, you can get better computation. You can get better storage. You can get better communication. But the only thing is that the deep, the you, you that latency is going to be hampered. The communication may create a, a lot of problem which cannot provide the result to the IoT devices in time. In order to avoid that, we have a fog layer in between the cloud and things. 
or IoT. So we have to also achieve the quality of service requirement because many applications are there where quality of service parameters are there. You can consider reliability, availability. These are the, some of the important QL quality of service parameter. At any case, you should not violate this quality of service. So in order to achieve this, we need an intermediate layer in between the IoT and cloud. So here you can see how the IoT devices are integrated with the fog and cloud computing environment. You can talk about uh, a smart home or you can talk about uh, a hospital or you can also talk about our intelligent transportation system where traffic is plays a very important role. So we, are deep, we have deployed a lot of sensor in our smart uh, home or hospital or you can say traffic management system. These sensors are collecting the data and they are pushing the data to the cloud. As cloud is very far away, the latency is increased. So in order to avoid this one, you can see now these sensors are not pushing their data to the cloud for computation or storage or other things. They are pushing the data to where? To the fog devices. Okay. Here also you can see in the hospital case, they are pushing the data to a fog device. Here also you can see in the traffic control data, the data is posed to a particular fog device. It may be a gateway, it may be a router. Okay, it may be a, a small data center also. So that data center, if it is capable to handle that one, then obviously it is going to process it or store it and immediately the result is going to be returned to the IoT devices. But if that computation which is required for that particular devices is not sufficient in the using these POC devices, so finally you have to depend on the cloud or you have to depend on other fog devices which can combinedly provide you that the services. Not only one fog device is going to provide you a service, you have a lot of fog devices. They are also going to integrate together so that combinedly they can provide the services to the IoT devices. The major difference if you see in the fog computing case, you are getting low latency, but in cloud case, you are getting high latency. If you can tolerate that latency, you can directly go to the cloud. There is no need of this fog layer. But whenever you are going for time critical application or other sensitive application where latency is a major goal, latency need to be minimized. In that case, fog computing is the solution. And it is not a replacement of the cloud. Fog is not going to replace the cloud, but it is providing a just like a complementary. If it can provide, then it is okay. If it is not provide, then ultimately cloud is going to provide you the solution because it is providing you a high performance, also high availability and a very large amount of storage and a large amount of computation, which fog cannot be provided. Now, as I said, when you go for the methodology to find the articles related to this cloud uh, fog and IoT, here, we primarily focus on analytical modeling. We are not focusing on the business modeling. You can do business modeling by finding some research articles. But here, our primary focus is to go for the analytical modeling. So some of the repositories in which these uh, articles are retrieved, whatever we are going to discuss, they are from the reputed uh, uh, repository like Science Direct, IEEE Explore, and ACM Digital Library. And they considered the integration of cloud computing with IoT. So as a term, they have considered either cloud and cloud computing or they considered IoT or the full form of IoT Internet of Things. Both things they have taken with the end clause. Because when you review, a, when you research a particular research article, you have to consider certain end clauses and certain or clauses, right? So after uh, carefully finding the number of research articles, so they found uh, around 1800 uh, articles in the repository of these three popular repository and based upon this integration you can see the number of articles uh, or you can see uh, the number of articles focusing on the integration of cloud fog and iot they only found only 23 articles so those articles are primarily not focusing on the integration we can discard it or those papers are focusing on business modeling, not on the analytical modeling, that also you can discard. And uh, those articles have considered the architecture 
which is not possible in reality. Okay, or it is it is mentioned as a theoretical architecture, or sometimes you are considering the system, sometimes you are considering the logistics, such things also discarded. After that, we got 23 articles. So you can see this is the summary of the articles. Initially, you have 1857 articles, but it is reduced to 23 articles. So these articles are searched based upon these criteria. There are three step process to identify the articles, whether they are dealing with the integration or not. First is the review process. First, you have to identify some of the research questions. And whenever you are research, finding a particular article, you have to look into the research questions. The research question may, may be whether integration of two technology that is cloud and IoT is considered in this article or not. Whether it is having some practical significance or not. Such type of research questions you have to consider while you are selecting a particular article. After finding such, such after uh, finding a value, each research questions you can give a particular weight factor. And uh, if the weight is greater than three, let's say out of five or seven out of ten, then only you will consider that as a uh, that paper is considered as a a part of our integration. Otherwise, you are going to discard that paper. Then also you have to find uh, also uh, from the abstract of that particular paper, whether that is useful or not, whether that is talking about the integration in reality or not. And based upon that also, you can discard some of the papers. Now, many papers uh, are there. They are related to various uh, analytical modeling. So these are the complete uh, one. You can see here wise I have mentioned here, but I'm not going through each and every one. I'll summarize in the next two next slide. Yes. So mostly the modeling techniques considered for cloud to fog to IoT, they have considered various areas. Like they want to model in the form of Petrinet, which is popularly used in the field of software engineering. They've also tried to model in the field of by model model by using the Markov chain model. They also uh, used the model as an integer linear program model. They also consider uh, to model this integration in the form of fault fuzzy ontology. They have also considered the conditional probability in order to represent in the form of a Bayesian model. Okay, and most of the articles they are following in the analytical models. So this is the segregation of these 23 articles into different areas where integration is modeled in the form of different models. So I'll tell you about uh, these things in detail so that you can understand actually how the cloud to fog to uh, IoT integration is done. So many people uh, focuses on the architecture. Like you know, in cloud service provider side, it is a physical architecture. We have physical component. The data center is the physical components. You have server. But when you look into the customer perspective, it is a virtual component. So you need the integration of this physical component with the virtual component. Right? So in order to go for integration, you can represent the physical component and virtual component in the form of various vectors. Okay. What may be the vector? The computation may be one of the vectors. Storage may be one of the vector. Quality of service, if you are considering, that can be considered as one of the vector, vector component, right? And uh, based upon the workload of uh, different type of task, based upon the volume of the data, based upon the content of the data, how sensitive that particular content also, you can design the vectors. So here, they formed that in the form of analytical modeling where they specially considered two factors. One is power consumption factor, another is time efficiency. And they consider various gateways because gateways are the devices that is in between the IoT to the cloud. And they have also considered how much data you are receiving in the gateway, how much data is processed, how many, how much data is pushed to the cloud. And based upon the availability of the gateway okay available space of the gateway the data is going to be transferred to the higher layer for further processing so each and every fog devices is first to analyze right whether it can process that thing or not or whether it can provide the data or not 
and periodically it can push the data to the cloud or periodically make it makes it uh, it makes it vacant so that a new request can be accommodated in that particular fog device and many people also focused on the scheduling mechanism in iot environment where they consider processing load of each and every device available memory space and bandwidth in order to design various models that which iot devices task will map to which uh, gateway the mapping between a set of iot devices and set of gateway and also many people consider the prediction uh, predict the quality of service of the iot devices as i already said latencies can be considered as a uh, quality of service response time can be considered as a quality of service or network condition a lot of factors you can consider scalability okay uh, availability again it depends upon mean time between failure mean time to repair these factors you have to consider in order to fulfill the quality of service requirement so this is the scheduling model they have designed like in order to complete a particular task suppose you consider that task is one one means 100 percent of that particular task and suppose you are observing the task in uh, so from the starting of that particular task till the completion of the task and in each and every time frame or in, in each and every time instance, you are checking that how much of the task is completed. So that uh, working status is considered as a SI of T. Okay, suppose you are executing a particular IoT task and 50% of the task is completed. So I can consider this SI of T is 0 0.5. So 50% is completed and 50% is yet to complete. And you are observing this over a particular period of time. Let the period is from 0 to T. You have started at, let's say, 8 p.m. And you want to complete it by 8.30. So that is your period. That is 0 to 8 to 8.30. That is, that is considered as your 0 to T. In addition to those parameters, you have to also see that what is the CPU utilization. And you have to see that the CPU utilization of each and every task, because we are considering n number of tasks. That's why you can see in each and every condition we have sum of i is equal to 1 to n okay so we'll start with one device you can go up to n device so each and every device is going to uh, uh, is uh, going to be modeled in the form of some cpu utilization so some of those devices cpu utilization is not exceeding the total cpu utilization that is the first constant second constant says that uh, the memory capacity the sum of the memory capacity of each and every device should not exceed the total memory capacity that is available for fog devices. Similarly, you can calculate the input bandwidth and output bandwidth for n different applications, which is given by n different devices. Similarly, you can see there are other parameters are also there, like we are considering various factors, that is CPU overloading factor, memory overloading factor, input bandwidth and output bandwidth to model the scheduling model and uh, you have to see that uh, these constraints need not be uh, need, needs to be fulfilled they should not be violated okay otherwise you cannot provide the services to that particular iot devices similarly many researchers also they have modeled uh, the energy consumption like in the previous talk also i told you we are not only concerned about the utilization but also we are concerned about the energy consumption okay also, we are considering because we are deploying the application in the cloud. So we are also greedy about what is the cost. The cost need not be uh, a very high, which cannot be affordable by a particular user. So the energy consumption of the device and cloud billing method for a set of devices is considered using this particular formula, right? So here also we are monitoring period is T, right? We consider n number of devices. And we are considering what is the consumption rate and uh, what is the time in which uh, the entire system is completely idle. That is called as idle energy consumption. Because if you are putting in idle mode, it is also consuming energy. So based upon these factors, right, or some threshold and probability density function, they have modeled the energy consumption. Okay. It is also based upon the transfer of cost of the device, the transfer cost of IoT devices to the fog layer or fog 
to the again the to the cloud layer and the processing in the cloud layer again return the result from cloud to fog or fog to iot based upon that this is calculated yes you can see the energy consumption there is a simple energy consumption formula in which you can calculate the energy consumption between iot to the cloud infrastructure so in the bottom layer you have iot in intermediate layer you have fog in the top layer you have cloud so if you want to calculate energy consumption between iot to the cloud so here we consider the gateway here we consider the gateway is a fog device you can consider router also right based upon the model so we are calculating the energy consumption of okay because iot devices has to transfer the data to the fog fog has to process it if it is capable okay and it has to return the result to the iot right so we are estimating how much energy is consumed between iot fog or fog to a cloud or in total you can say iot to the cloud so it depends upon four parameter first parameter says that energy consumed by iot gateways when receiving the data from iot devices or sensors when you are receiving the data you are you are consuming energy again when you are transmitting also you are also in consuming energy that is considered by the second parameter third parameter case also we are considering energy that is energy due to the transport network because you are moving from one infrastructure to another infrastructure so that energy also we are considering and also we are considering energy consumed by the data center the components that are used for processing or storing that energy also we need to consider in order to model the energy consumption similarly here you can see we are only calculating the energy between iot to the fog so we are considering same that is gateway receiving r stands for receiving and uh, next is c okay this is nothing but energy consumed by iot gateways for local computation and processing because these devices can do some kind of local computation also one of the example you can consider the smart watch we are processing locally and we are returning the result that is also possible right and also we are considering a ratio that is called as beta here right which is nothing but the number of updates from the fog to the cloud for synchronization if you want to keep the data in the cloud temporarily you are keeping your data in the gateway so in order to accommodate the further request the data is finally need to be transferred to the cloud only okay so these are the parameters you need to consider when you are talking about energy many researchers also modeled this integration by considering this as a reliability of various component so you can calculate the reliability of uh, the devices that is connected in serial or reliability of the devices that is connected in parallel so considering n system the n system may be connected may be in parallel right or they may be considered in serial right so this is a parallel connection in some cases we consider n subsystems are there they are connected using series right so here the isr you can see in the first term we are taking n number of subsystems we are calculating the product of that that is represented as pi okay that is reliability of each subsystem you have to find the reliability of the first component second component third component and based upon that you can say it is the reliability of the whole system the second term is multiplied here with the first term which says that availability of f input files what you are doing you are transferring some data the data is considered as in the form of input files or different kind of programs you can say that you are transferring so such factor we need to consider in order to calculate the reliability of the whole system and specially many people have targeted the smart home context in order to calculate the reliability of the system many people also consider this as an optimization problem and they model this problem as an apsa problem where you want to achieve a higher cost okay you have to take both factor capacity and cost into concern and you have to see that how you can maximize it not only a single objective they are considering here multiple objective like here you can see first objective they considered how we can minimize the energy second objective you have to minimize the overload machine 
you have to share the load among all the machine equal load to each and every resources. Third one is you have to minimize the overall allocation of the services. Not only a single objective you want to achieve here, but you want to achieve multiple objectives in a single go. That's why they represent in the form of NAPSA problem. Similarly, as I said, many people also consider Patrinet. So Patrinet, like our flow chart, we are representing in the form of a set of symbol. In Patrinet also, you have to use different kind of symbol. For example, the circle is representing a particular place or you can say state. Okay. And a dot is representing a token. Right. And a arrow is representing connection or control. Okay. And if there are multiple arrows are like there in this particular structure, then you can consider this is in relation. Okay. And uh, a vertical bar or a rectangle that can be considered as an event. So they model the integration of this cloud fog and uh, IoT in the form of a Patrinet model. Okay. So let us see a simple model. So these are the symbols generally used in order to design a Patrinet model. You can go for sequential, you can go for conflict. Conflict means you either you have to choose T1 or you have to choose T2. Like if you have two options in a particular case, you have to choose either the first option or the second option. Similarly, concurrent, at a time you can execute two things. Similarly, we need synchronization, mutual exclusive and priority. These are the different symbols that are used in a simple Patrinet model. And they consider four possible steps in order to design this Patrinet model. First one is called as availability, which they represent here as AB. Second one is non-availability, okay, or you can say not availability, that is represented as NAB. So when you want to move from AB to NAB, then you need a event. In, a, in order to execute a particular event, then only you can move from availability state to not availability state. Now let us say the system is available. You are assigning a particular job to that particular system. Then it is changing its state from available to not available. Similarly, there are two positions also we have considered. One is called as in, another is called as out. So they consider four possible states in order to design this particular model. So let us see that particular model. So this is the complete model. Okay, so this is a state, okay. And as I said, this is nothing but a uh, event, okay? And here you can see there is a single state in which there are four arrows are there. So they are just like your alternatives. Either you have to choose the first alternative or second or third or fourth. And as I said, you have four state, AB, availability, non-availability, in and out, right? So consider this particular state. Now you can see here, it is nothing but P of AB slash in. And if you are exit from the system, you are executing a particular task, the task is completed. So it has to exit. Then a event occur, that is a completion event, which converts P AB of in to P AB of out. State is available from available to Available, it is available in both cases, it is available. Now there is an in of a particular task. That's why you are busy here. You are executing a particular task. After executing that particular task, you want to remove it and you want to accommodate another task. So you are changing your state from in to out. Similarly, if a new task is coming, it is going to enter. Then again, you are moving from out state to the in. State. But a resource is not available, but in our queue, we have a set of jobs. So whenever the resource is going to be available, we have to assign that job to the resources, right? So here also, if you exit, then the in is going to be move its state to out. Similarly, if when you enter, it is moving out state to the in state. Okay. Now, 
you can see another one. If you see it is horizontal wise, the state is PAV in, right? When you want to leave, leave means now that resource is not by part of your system. So availability is changed to now not availability. But when you want to join a resource is unplugged or, or is not, it is not uh, supporting. So that is considered as non-availability. So when it is again support, then it is again changing the non-availability stage to the again the availability state. So in this way, they have designed this MCS system, which they called mobile crowd sensing as a service system. Okay, where they can model different uh, states in the form of a quaternet model. Now, they consider three things here. H, they have considered as a human user. PS, they have considered as a personal server. HA stands for a medical server. Okay. So, what is our IoT devices? IoT devices are nothing but the users. Hog devices are nothing but your personal servers. And uh, cloud is nothing but our medical server. So, there are three layers. So, you can see the modeling of that using Quaternet. So, these are nothing but uh, your IoT devices. You can see these are written as IoT devices. Okay. Let's say IoT devices are sensing a particular environment. Okay. In a particular application, let it be smart home or agriculture, any application. So when they are collecting the data, the data is pushed to where? The data is pushed to the personal server, that is PS. So personal has server has to process it. Okay. Suppose you can say it is generating the data per second basis and personal server has to aggregate it per minute basis. And it has to push the doubt, now push the data to the medical server. That is nothing but our HS, which is represented as a medical server. So not only that, you have a several modules. They're not only relying in one module, right? You may be, maybe different floor can be considered as one, one module. So you are capturing not only the data from one uh, floor, you are capturing the data simultaneously from different floor. Different IoT devices are equipped for that one. In some cases, in one floor, you require more device to process, more fog device to process. And in some cases, you require less devices to process based upon the need. So these fog devices also need to integrate together. Okay, they, are, they can pass uh, some information whenever there is a requirement to process a huge amount of data. So this is nothing but the mapping or matching of the device data to the user, which can assist tracking a transparent data trace route and possible detection of various data compromises. Okay, if there is any security applications also, in that case, you can also apply this thing. Also, people have used ILP, that is integer linear programming, right? So, you have to first decide whether your objective function is linear or not linear, because linear case, your local solution is equal to the global solution. But nonlinear case, your local solution is not equal to the global solution. And if your problem is involves continuous and discrete variables, right, then you can also apply mixed integer linear programming instead of integer linear programming. And the cost of this particular architecture, you can calculate like here, you can see the cost T that is nothing but the total cost that comprises of several other costs. What are the other costs? The other cost may lead to processing cost. It may be the storage cost. It may be uploading cost. It may be downloading cost. It may be the link cost, which is used in the transport network. If you sum all these costs, finally, you are going to get the total cost. Okay. So another research work in which their objective they have considered is to minimize the energy consumption. So they consider the consumption is composed of two things. That is the traffic induced. Suppose, like, for example, the queue is completely filled. Then the fog devices has to execute one by one. So at that time, if you are pushing something into the fog layer, then unnecessary, the traffic is increased. And there is no uh, point to keep that particular things into the fog layer because it is not having any space. So there also energy consumption is happen. And in order to processing something also you have you have to uh, consume energy. 
that's why they model this consumption in the form of traffic induced energy consumption and processing induced energy consumption the next one is that some people have modeled this uh, integration in the form of markov chain model okay and in markov chain model we are using a set of random variables okay what is our goal in this uh, using markov chain model again energy consumption they have taken into consideration they have considered iot devices they have considered the gateways they have considered the clouds so gateway devices has to collect information from the sensors and they have to post to the cloud so for this they have considered conditional probability just like uh, given a humidity temperature of a particular place if i asked you to predict whether there is rain or not so they consider they represented everything in the form of likelihood of a particular occurrence of a particular event okay whether there is a rain or not that depends upon this parameter so you are con considering conditional probability probability of x such that y so in that case they are they want to find if this much happen if this type of transfer happen then what is the energy consumption is going to what is the energy consumption if the transfer is through a particular device fog device then what is the energy consumption if it is to a device which is providing the response time better response time what is the energy consumption if one device is closed enough then what is the energy consumption so these things are modeled using the markov chain model so here you can see the markov model where they are considered four state one is called as network connection another is called as accelerometer uh, another is the idle state we are not doing anything another is keep alive state right these are the four states and uh, they considered like here you can see in between a to n that is the accelerometer of the data to this network connection in between that they consider the overhead that is called as pan a stands for scc n stands for nc so this is the p of n an similarly scc to the idle so it is p of ai or you can say that there is a transfer between from idle state to the scc state then it is p of ia like when you consider a particular virtual machine we consider whether a virtual machine is in the idle state or it is in the uh, sleep state or it is in the switch off state or it may be in the active state similarly you can see in between ideal to this keep alive state we have pik and pki so the transfer the transfer time is not equal to the receiving time the reason of taking to pik and pki is that the transmit time is not equal to the response time right or uplink time is not equal to your downlink time that's why we are considering both things simultaneously okay. other authors also applied uh, integration of various fields like fuzzy logic and uh, uh, the fault detection so they have identified what kind of faults are possible in this integration because when you integrate the various technology you may get uh, various type of faults okay so this faults uh, they have modeled in the form of uh, this um, uh, fuzzy ontology model like they apply to in the field of wireless sensor network and they observe that these are the different type of faults that can I, that can result while you are integrating various technologies one of the popular fault that you know that is called as a stock problem right it may be stock at a zero problem or stock at one problem stock at zero means it is uh, always providing zero volt irrespective of the input stock at one means it is always providing a plus 5 volt irrespective of the input and other faults also like uh, erratic uh, fault bias fault hard hard over fault uh, and uh, spike fault and each and every fault they considered in the form of fuzzy logic like in fuzzy logic we consider whether the it whether it is low or high or whether it is uh, very small small medium uh, uh, high very high such type of modelings you can find here like you can see here it is low and high here in bias case it is negative or positive and uh, hard over case it is also negative and positive spike case also whether there is a spike in spike fault or not whether it is positive or negative so in this way they modeled uh, the faults in the form of fuzzy logic 
by using the fuzzy logic concepts. So these are the some of the future research directions you can go through. Like uh, managing the infrastructure is always a challenging, right? Because the number of devices is increasing, right? So you have some complexity issues. Complexity is also related to the type of data generated by each and every devices. Okay. So increasing complexity, a management complexity is also a very challenging task while you are going for integration. Similarly, obviously, there is a chance of failure while you are mapping. Suppose I'm mapping a particular job to a gateway and let's say the gateway is failed. Right? Then you have to see that uh, how the request can be directed to another gateway. For this also, if you go for Amazon Web Service, there are different type of policies are there. There may be a wetted policy. There is another uh, policy which is related to geolocation, proximity policy, number of policies they are considering in order to handle these requests. Similarly, uh, the gateways need to be distributed among uh, in various uh, uh, locations where you want to collect the data. And we have to see that uh, each and every gateways are equally loaded. No one is overloaded, no one is underloaded. Similarly, we can minimize the downtime. We have to avoid the failures in the system. We have to also manage these resources in the IoT layer as well as fog layer as well as in the cloud layer. And there is no specific standardization or rules and regulation while you are modeling this thing or while you are sending this thing. There is no standardization of each and every devices or there is no standard protocol to follow by all the providers. That's why sometimes also the standardization leads to any time to any kind of binder lock-in problem because our system is completely a heterogeneous system. Such type of problems can happen. And as our devices are exponentially increasing, you may also reach to the state space explosion problem, right? One particular state, uh, one particular location, you may have a lot of devices are generating data. Another, another particular state, uh, there are less number of devices are connected and they are generate, they are not generating enough amount of data. It may happen, right? So such type of problems also you may face. So these are the some of the problems where you can focus on. Uh, where we want interested in the integration of these fields. So I'll stop here because the rest things uh, I'll cover in the uh, while we are going for offline FDP that is related to the IFOX sim. And I'll show you uh, some of the references. Yeah, you can follow uh, this book that is Fog and Edge Computing Principle Paradigm by Professor Buya. It's a nice book. And also, if you are a interested in ifox sim which also follows this uh, integration then you can go by the article by professor uh, buya and professor goes and his team the last article which is published in 2017 in software practice and experience widely publication you can go through it okay thank you everyone if you have any question you can ask